to wide the truck. Oh man, welcome to What the Truck. Good afternoon, dude. Good afternoon, Dooner. How are you today, man? I'm doing great, and I'm really excited because we have a huge show on the back of multiple huge shows that we've had on What the Truck. It just keeps getting bigger over here. Today, we're talking to, and I'm proud to announce, Nikola Motor Company going public with their CEO and founder, Trevor Milton, saying Christopher is getting closer to that $1 million goal they announced on What the Truck on Monday. Amen. We got a... Molo Solutions CEO Andrew Silver, if you tuned into Monday's show, you know that they talked about the big donation that they were giving away right in the comments section live during the show. Super excited about that. Trucker Wayne Craig and uh, the Dart Network CEO Dave Abels. Dave Abels getting back in the truck after 25 years off the road. They're going to call in from their road trip. And HE Logistics CEO Hope White is going to help us maybe get some answers on the some of these crises going on in America. We're going to talk about diversity, talk about how we can make the supply chain and trucking better for all of us involved. And I think it's the right time for it. Are you ready? I am very ready. This is all, and you're exactly on the back to back, just bigger, bigger, better shows. Un unbelievable. Yeah, I'm, I'm real. I'm, I'm ready today. I, this is going to be an awesome one. I can't wait. Hey, before we jump into it, I'm going to, I'm going to go a little Shark Tank on you and, and pitch an idea to you. Okay. All right. All right. So I, I have a three-year-old and five-year-old boys. We've talked about them on here. You've got your own kids, and I have the problem. They're at that stage right now where. In the middle of the night, they'll jailbreak out of the bunk beds, and they jump in the uh, this bed right here behind me. So I'm thinking that we need a, par a parent-sized bed. So it's like a, like a king plus. And I know they have California kings, but that just makes it longer. I need something wider so the kids and the dog and all of that can fit on board. You in? Uh, all right. I, I, I like your idea, and more importantly, I like you. I like I like your energy. But it is a very difficult space, and you're going to need a lot of help from me to to not get eaten up by the big dog. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you the money, but mm. I want 45 percent of the business, and I want twenty dollars in royalty per sale uh, until I get my money back, and then and then it'll it'll go to 19.99 uh, in perpetuity. <laughs> well, I guess I should say uh, you're welcome. Welcome to <laughs> honestly, I can go on and on. I can explain every natural phenomenon: the tide, the grass, the ground. Oh, that was Maui just messing around. Yeah, I've been hanging out. With <laughs> nice. Long, man. Uh, Eric Serta says that uh, he has he's already made the uh, this parent size bed. He has two kings right next to each other at his house. See, I don't want that little gap in the middle though, because you know what's going to happen. Then everyone just sort of falls in that like a like a San Andreas fault of sorts. Can't you just take your California King and turn it sideways and then it'd be wider? Yeah, but then my legs would hang off at the end. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a, that, that is an issue. <laughs> that yeah. is an issue. <laughs> Uh, hey, today's show is brought to you by a uh, company that doesn't need a Shark Tank. It's Pilot Flying J Axle Fuel Card, which provides the credit you need and fast approvals and money back. There are no transaction fees and no monthly fees. No way. So sign up for yours today at AxleFuelCard.com. Axle Fuel Card keeps fleets on a roll. Subject to credit approval and terms and conditions may apply. Ingrid Brown. Hey, uh, Mark Hurwitz are in the comments and Hey, Emily Zink. She's uh, she says she's excited for the show. Well, let's start off with, uh, what else is new? A little bad news, right? Trucking transportation jobs dropped slightly in May. Well, let's say a little good news, bad news. So we'll get into it. John Kingston, he reports the number of workers employed in the trucking and transportation sector tracked by the Bureau of Labor Statistics fell slightly in May to 1,431,600 jobs from 140 one one million four hundred and thirty two eight hundred the month before uh, I hate reading numbers. The figure was reported in the monthly unemployment statistics released today by the BLS. Important to note here that it uh, that it is all jobs within the transportation sector, including back out office and not necessarily drivers. Important to make the distinction because as, uh, as you're going to tell us, we did hear about some good employment numbers, right? Yeah, we did. So the good news here is that the U.S. jobless rates fell to 13.3 percent in in May, and I believe what was it, 14.6, I believe, or 14.7. Uh, the economy added 2.5 million jobs, which is the largest monthly gain in jobs since the BLS uh, started tracking numbers in 
Wayne Dooner. So uh, it comes as a pretty big surprise, as the Labor Department noted, that during the pandemic, millions of peop- uh, workers were actually misclassified as employed but not at work. According to CNN, if it weren't for those misclassifications, the unemployment rate would have been much higher, around 19.2 percent in April and 16.1 percent in May, uh, not including seasonal adjustments. So uh, uh, you know, it leaves us with some hope that there will see a rebound in transportation jobs in, in, in the June report. But, you know, we're going to have to watch that uh, the environment. Oh, man, I've already got a competitor. All right, Kieran, J- Kieran Jaram, he says that there already is this custom-sized bed, and he's, he's got a link to it above. So I guess I don't even have to make this product off the ground. There goes my hopes and dreams. Uh, I, so Mark, uh, I withdraw my offer. I'm out. You're dead to me. Uh, yeah, I know. I didn't do the full disclosures. You know that like only 10% of Shark Tank deals actually go through because then in the discovery period afterwards, they find out that there was something misaligned about the pitch. Is that right? Uh, okay. Yeah. I believe it. I believe it. Market Watch reports that federal policy makers will meet next week with federal chairman Jerome Powell holding a press conference on Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. The Fed is also expected to release its first economic forecast since the coronavirus pandemic forced the economy to shut down in mid-March. Those numbers are going to be hugely important. You're going to be very important. And uh, north of the border, transportation job losses slow as Canada starts to recover. The transportation and warehousing sector improves as Canada's economy adds a surprising 290,000 jobs in May. Uh, additionally, Dooner, in Sonar, we're watching the Canadian truckload volumes, and they're still on the rise, and they're very close to a 52-week high in their truckload uh, volumes. And also cross-border traffic of trucks is, is, uh, is on the mend or gaining momentum, I should say. I like the good news, man. Hey, Tony Anderson does, too. He's in the comments. He says, happy Friday. Happy Friday to you. Yeah, Tony, man. speaking yeah. of seminar. Uh, volume faucet, and you just mentioned it there. Volume faucet is on full blast, but the rates are still in a dribble. They haven't caught up yet. That's right. This week's DHL Supply Chain Pricing Power Index is out, and it's up another 5%. Good news for some of you. That's right. It's uh, what is it? It's at 30 now. It was at 25 last week. It's still favoring the shippers. 50 is at equilibrium. 100 favors the carriers. Getting closer to that equilibrium, though. Yeah, it is getting closer to that equilibrium, which is really between 40 and 60, I guess, as you, if you talk to, to Andrew Cox, and it, it really comes in at 40, 50. But anyways, outbound tender volumes posted the highest uh, June 4th total in a three-year series history. They're still above 2018, which was the, the, the highest. And while it, it really doesn't match the surge we saw in March due to the pre-stocking, uh, but for, for this time of year, it's, it is telling how aggressive the volumes are. Uh, and it's interesting to see that the trending in the Memorial day lead up and recovery Dooner is is really typical of the season this this slight little slowdown and then leveling off is keeping it above 2018 so it'll be interesting to watch where this goes yeah volumes have made a near miraculous climb over the past few weeks and there isn't much to point towards for a slowdown at this moment capacity is reacting very slowly to this volume surge but otri that's our outbound tender reject index has finally broken that five percent threshold spot markets have come alive in the past weeks but rates still remain specifically below where carriers would expect them to be in normal times so operations a little bit difficult typically we see seven to ten percent rejections for real or significant upward pressure on spot rates so Keep monitoring that, though, and good news out there, especially if you've been struggling these past couple of months. One more quick thing before we get to a phone call. The future of alternative meat. This was an interesting report I read this morning. It said that it's a growing threat to the trucking industry. They say here in its report, investment company UBS has forecast that alternative meat industry's market size to go. It's forecasted to go up from 4.6 billion in 2018 all the way to 85 billion by the end of the decade in 2030, expecting a growth of 28 percent year over year. So, you know, good investment opportunity there. The alternatives do not stop with meat, with product lines, including plant based eggs, milk. UBS believes the plant based industry shows exceptional promise, estimating the sector to be worth 37.5 billion in just five Five years by 2025. Yeah, you know, and the the alternative meat industry's relevance in transportation can't be uh, it, 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 it can't be um, understated. Though the alternative meat companies count on a wide variety of consumers, including vegans, vegetarians, and meat eaters alike. Their growth will come at the expense of conventional meat industry transportation. If livestock volumes decrease, it will eventually mean fewer uh, freight trips. Uh, the ag freight sector now faces a disruption that it cannot circumvent, according to the new report. Uh, but Duna, really, I have one question. For for you. How yeah. long do you how long do you smoke an eight pound plant based brisket? You know, I'll tell you something, man. I uh, I'm a vegetarian. I've been one for a year. So is so is my wife. So I've been cooking a lot of different. I've perfected the art of cooking the frozen 
the frozen veggie burger. But you, it depends on the thickness and all that stuff. I don't know if a brisket would would really work. I've had tofurkey before. It, it doesn't pass my snuff test. But I'd contend, uh, I'd contend something this report says, that— uh, that if you still have to move and ship all of these uh, these alternative meats via reefer and in the grocery supply chain. So I don't know if it's some sort of nightmare scenario for agriculture unless companies are not aware of this and they don't pivot. So the point to me of this report is just to be aware, especially you're moving reefer, that maybe this is a space to start getting in, especially if you know that it's growing. I, that's what I would be doing. Absolutely solid point. Absolutely solid point. It means a shifting of, of the transportation and, you, and exactly like you said, you need to stay aware and be able to pivot when you need to. Totally. And uh, Catherine Burke says, yo, sorry I'm late to the cast. Do you know what we're going to do now, though? Catherine, no worries. You can show up anytime. It's also on demand. And Mark Hurwitz says the V curve is in full effect. Let's get back to work. Let's, talking about getting back to work, let's talk to Andrew Silver. We're going to dial him up right now, who's uh, who's helping truckers who may not be able to get to work get back hey, on their Andrew. feet with a big donation they did. It's Oh, where'd he go? Andrew Silver. <laughs> Let's dial him right back. We just did lost. you hang up on him, dude? I did not hang up on him. I think he just heard me talking and hung up. He was like, he's already going up. Hey, hey, Andrew, what's up, man? How we doing? We're doing really good. Glad to have you with Dooner and the Dude on What the Truck. Uh, uh, it, it's amazing time. And uh, I know, but before we even get into that, I know that Vincent's a huge fan of U of M, so uh, I, I bet he's a- <laughs> Yeah. Oh, H, Andrew. <laughs> Oh, God. Get that out of here. Yeah. Dude, what do you got here? <laughs> All right, Dave, you shared a powerful letter on LinkedIn the other day that reads in part, the commitment we've made to our people will first and foremost hear them, we'll empathize with them, we will do all we can to help them and resource at our disposal and live up to the values of our, our business, family, resilience, accountability. Hey, first of all, thank you for speaking up, but why is it important to you and Molo to get that message out there? You know, we're in an interesting time, you know, uh, as a business owner, especially a young business owner, this is my first time doing this. And, and I feel like our generation of leaders, you can't just separate work and, and personal lives and pretend that they're two different things. I mean, they are two different things, but everything is so much more intersected, especially as, as you've seen COVID come and, and have such a big impact on our lives where we're all, it, it's all one thing now, so to speak. So our people spoke to me and they said, we, we, we need to stand up and, and, and speak for our values and speak for what we care about. I need to know that Molo cares. And, and I spent all day on, on Monday just having calls with, with various people within our organization to hear their feelings and their thoughts. And collectively, we came up with our what we felt was the right message for us. And I think part of that, the important part is, is not the message so much as the action you take after the message. And we're going to spend a lot of time now trying to understand the best way that we can have a positive impact in the community and within our business. Yeah, couldn't well, agree so- couldn't agree more, Andrew. A- excellent stuff. So on, on Monday's What the Truck, you were talking to Shan- uh, we were talking to Shannon Courier of St. Christopher's uh, Trucker Relief Fund when your team announced in the comment section that you had hit, and as we understand it, you actually crushed your own internal fundraising goal for the fund. Can you tell us the story behind that? Yeah, so it, it's a funny story because we, we I don't even think we were planning to necessarily market this, but I, I know our people are just excited and proud, and, and TJ went ahead and informed everybody. So to kind of take you back, the first month, second month of, of COVID was really tough. I mean, it was just really difficult to keep our people engaged and committed, given that like our world was falling down around us. I mean, it, it, this was something nobody had ever been through before. And, and so, you know, for us, we were growing. We, we were fortunate that our customers trusted us in a lot of our business and food and beverage. So we, we, weren't, we weren't having to go through layoffs. And, and, and that was something that we were just grateful for. And we realized we, we, needed, we needed to step up and, and find a way to give back. So uh, I spoke to our, our philanthropy committee chair, Natalie Mathis, and said, can you go find me an organization where we, we can give back directly to the people who take care of us, which are the truck drivers? Right, and after some research, now they found a thing for truckers fund. And so we talked to Shannon, I think back in April, and said, you know what, this would be a good rallying cry for our people who are now in their third month of quarantine, their third month of being stuck at home. And in Chicago, that's especially tough because you've got these smaller apartments, and we were on quarantine longer than most states. So it, it was challenging for everybody. We said, you know what, let's, let's create an opportunity for everybody to rally together. Let's do a month-long thing where for every load, we'll donate $5. 
Steve Robinson leading the way, donating fifty thousand dollars. That's incredible, right? And they're leaders in our industry. They are the big, the big behemoths in the industry, and we're just little old Molo, at least for now. And so, I said, you know what? Let's take these guys on, right? If we match them, great. If we beat them, even better. Uh, and, and the best part of it was, it was going to be really close. I mean, you have to ship ten thousand loads in a month to get to that fifty thousand number. On Friday afternoon, before our company wide speech or company wide meeting, uh, the numbers looked like we were going to come up at about forty eight seven. So I sent out a message to everybody. I was like, Listen, if you'd like to donate out of your own pocket, feel free. Do not feel any pressure whatsoever to do so. But this is giving back to the people who take care of us. And lo and behold, within thirty minutes, we'd raised another twelve thousand dollars. It, it was it was truly incredible. That is that's badass, Andrew. Uh, it, and it's 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 great to hear that, uh, especially in tough times in in the industry. And one of the things I love about supply chain is, is how willing so many organizations are willing to you know put the logo down and help each other out or use competition to inspire your team in a positive way. You know, a lot of people have been working from home feeling disconnected, and you're quoted in Freight Waves talking about this, and you used it as an opportunity to bring your team together. W- was it successful? I mean, it was successful in the race, but do you think it also worked uh, from a working sense? It helped bond the team. A- absolutely, it did. absolutely. Our marketing team did a, did a phenomenal job every day of keeping us updated on where the numbers were, and we actually tied every load to a carrier or customer that was giving us those loads, so they could feel the direct impact that they were making. So, you know, a carrier rep for us sees that their carrier, Alville Trucking, moves move twenty loads. Boom, that's a hundred bucks, right? Or, or Kraft Heinz gives us, you know, a hundred loads. Boom, that's five hundred bucks. And, and it was keeping track, and it created a little bit of competition between reps. To say shit, I want my customer to be number one, or I want my carrier to be number one. It, it was awesome. It was it was it was a really really cool experience, and something that I'm so glad that in bringing us together, we could actually be giving back to our community. Yeah, that's really awesome, Andrew. You know, gamification of the job and numbers and so on, it can be very, very effective. But, but especially when you've got it behind some a, a charity and a cause that people can all gather, gather around as, as a team and really drive it forward. And um, But, you know, we've been, we've been talking about uh, the returning to normal, um, but these past two weeks have taught us that normal has uh, never been normal for anyone in America who's marginalized. How would you like to see the return to work go? When you ask me how I would like to see the return of the work, are you are you speaking specifically around COVID and the safety with the yeah. bar? Yeah. So for me, it's it's we're, we're I'm most concerned about my people's mental health at this point, right? So I don't we don't need to be back in the office. We don't have to. It would be great to get everybody back, but for me, it's more about we've had people in Chicago in their tiny little apartments with restaurants that just opened a day ago. So for three months, people have been cramped in their in their homes, uh, and, and that scares me. It, it really does. So I just want to create a safe environment for people to get back here. You know, we have 350 open desks right now, uh, and, and the way we'll probably come back is spacing them out so maybe 50 or 60 are being used at once. We're giving people the freedom to do what they'd like in terms of coming back. I'm not going to require anybody to come back, but likely for all of this year. Uh, it, it depends on a variety of things. But for me, I, it's just about creating the opportunity for people who feel like they need to get out of their homes to come back and have a safe environment they can come work out of. I mentioned that at the beginning of this interview, I mentioned that letter that you posted on LinkedIn too, and, and you threw some support out there for Black Lives Matter. So the, the other aspect of returning to, to normal and it, and it being marginalized means that some, for some people, normal isn't good enough. What can we do as supply chain leaders as, as we move forward? We, we need to step up. We need to challenge one another. And this isn't something where, like, Molo's got to be better than everybody else. If we've got a good idea that, that creates equity in our environment within the freight industry, then we should share it. Everybody should be supporting one another. There, there are ways where I want to compete with every single one of our competitors. There are ways that I want to be better than them at everything, right? But this isn't one of them, right? This is not. So we've got a team of people who are going to be spending some time talking, listening, learning, and understanding what kind of policies, what kind of things can we do as an organization to create a more equitable world for everybody, specifically within transportation, but really just in general. And if we have great ideas, we're going to share them. I don't have to beat you in this regard, right? We're all on the same team. Wow. Man, uh, hey, Andrew, we, we, we got to get to our next call, but a couple of comments came in here. Shannon Courier, she says, Andrew, your team is so generous and it's been great getting to know you all. We are so appreciative of the Molo team. Kenneth Carter III says, man, it's great what you're doing. D- uh, Danielle Solita, she says, Andrew is a fantastic leader. Where do people go to learn more? 
Where do people go to learn more? Yeah, where should they go to, like, to, to learn more about Molo? Oh, our website, chipmolo.com, uh, has plenty of information about us. We are, you know, in, 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 a, in a sentence, I believe we're the best transportation company in the industry in terms of the service we provide to our customers and to our carriers. Andrew, this thank morning, you. I was, oh, sorry. sorry. No, keep going. I was just going to say this morning, one of the coolest things I've had happen thus far is we just opened a package from Kraft Heinz awarding us uh, recognition for the service we provided them over the, the COVID pandemic. And that, to me, that speaks to why we started this business. I mean, these are awards. This is our first opportunity to win something like that for a large company, and we, and we did. It just speaks to the hard work our team puts in every day. Awesome stuff, Andrew. Thank you so much Great for your stuff. time today Great and your stuff. generous donation. I, we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Take it Thanks, easy. Andrew. Wow, and, and Kieran Jeremin, he says, uh, Andrew, it was amazing to listen to you talk about the culture as a way of life during your talk with Arrive. So speaking out in the industry, good stuff. Introduce our next desk, uh, guest. I'm going to dial him up. Oh, we got Trevor Milton, CEO and founder of Nicola in Phoenix, Arizona. So uh, it, it, this is going to be an interesting one. It, it, it just, some, just went public, Dooner. Hi, you're on the line with Dooner and the Dude. Hey Tim, Trevor, how you doing? Oh, hey Trevor, thank you for thank you for picking up, man. We are excited to uh, to speak with you. You had this is an amazing time to talk to you as well. Very uh, congratulations on the great news with with going public with the NKLA on the Nasdaq and a really nice valuation as well. Thanks, man. It's been a pretty crazy, pretty pretty crazy um, journey to get here, but it's uh, it's one of those moments in life where you're. Where when it's done, you're really happy, and uh, you're also really grateful. <laughs> I, I love the quote. There's this quote that you had on on freight waves, and it, it's a sentiment. I kind of like that. It sounds like you have a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. You said you want to come to market and prove to everyone that this is not a vaporware fraud. How fulfilling is it to do this merger and get on NASDAQ and get a chance to to put it out there in the market? Well, I think that, it, well, first of all, it feels incredible. Um, the main reason why is that when the whole WeWork debacle happened. You know, they found out that the house was a house of glass, right? So when a crack started happening, the whole thing came down. And in the private market, a lot of people would instantly, after WeWork, they instantly just said, you know, what? why are you not the next WeWork? You know, they were very skeptical about anybody. It didn't matter who they were. So going public has a unique, uh, a, you have a unique ability to show everything inside your company, all your finances, your contracts, your profits, your losses, everything. So it's essentially like an open book to all the investors. And it felt really good because once Nikola went public, the biggest investment firms in the world, like PSAM and, and Fidelity and BlackRock, all these other groups, they put in, you know, we, we raised over $700 million yesterday and we'll have almost a billion dollars in our balance sheet soon. And that's a, that's an incredible thing to let investors know that you're legitimate and you're not, you're not the next, uh, you know, glass house. Yeah, it's really exciting stuff, Trevor. Mike Vincent here. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being on. I, you know, I, I read a great article uh, by you on LinkedIn where you talked about failing and getting back up, right? I, you, you failed a number of times at businesses, but found your love. You, you remained hopeful. And you, there was a, a, a quote from, uh, I believe it was a Twitter conversation that you were having with somebody, but it was, uh, uh, hope is what turns resistance into success, which I loved. So, uh, but you also talked about starting Nicola in uh, in in your basement. Can you share a little bit about that journey with us? Yeah, you know, I I I love that quote too, and it just came out as I was writing it. It wasn't you know anything pre planned, and it it it's so true. I mean, um, so many people give up. You know, they give up after the third or fourth failure. They give up after they've just been everything's just been handed. You know, and they've had a lot of bad things happen in a row. And the odds are that you're not going to succeed in, in business if you start your own company. I always tell people that. So you have to know that you're playing against the house's you know, odds. And so the only way to win is continually play until you do hit it. You know, If you're at a casino, eventually you're going to hit red or black, right? Uh, you might lose a lot of times, but you hit it eventually. And what you really hope is, is that by the time you've hit it, you've prepared to kind of know which one's going to be the highest likelihood of success. And then you've got to have a lot of hope and a lot of faith to continue on until you hit it. And then when you do hit it, you've got to have the, you got to have the knowledge how to make sure you execute at that point correctly, because those chances don't come around very often. I really appreciate. So that's, that's kind of, I was going to say, yeah, right. I, I, just to put some context to his thing, too, I really appreciated that article that you posted on LinkedIn about and the, the, how you're speaking to people who may be in a, in a bad place or maybe unemployed. And you talked about some of the failures that you had and how Nicholas started in that basement. I just thought it was powerful as well. 
Yeah, it did. It started in our basement and we were there for almost a year. Uh, it was, if you, if you actually go back and talk to some of the original employees and almost every one of them still worked for me, it is such a funny story. We, we literally had the cops called on us because we had, you know, there's a whole, whole basement full of guys down there. And they, like the neighbors had no idea what was going on and we have computers everywhere and the cops would show up and we'd give them tours of the house and let them see what we're working on. Cause they didn't know if we're running some kind of, uh, some kind of like, you know, some, some kind of, uh, you know, bad, bad operation out of the basement. It was pretty fun. <laughs> some we, uh, nefarious activities going on in Trevor's household. I was going to say, nefarious. actually one of, one of the neighbors told them that we were running a prostitution ring. And so I was laughing, <laughs> you know, cause there's a, a bunch of guys and a couple at that time, a couple of women that worked for us. And so, uh, you know, it was, it was really, it was really crazy to think about like where we started, how we started in our basement and we would give like, whenever the cops would come, we'd give them a tour of the whole basement and all the engineering and let them see that we're, we're an engineering group. We just didn't have the capital at that time, you know, uh, to go in and lease a big building. And it was uh, too risky because at that time, I'm, you know, like I told you, the odds are against you. Right. And so I was like, all right, I'm not going to go all in yet. I'm just going to dabble. And I just want to make sure that like, I've got all my ducks in an order. And it took me a year until I felt comfortable enough to actually move into a, move into a building. And that article I wrote was, was all during the big coronavirus where everyone was getting laid off and it was just a really sad time. Right. And so it was, it, it, it's some of the most valuable advice I've ever given in my, there's two articles I would recommend anyone go read. And they're probably the, some of the most valuable articles you'll ever read in your life. I I'm not just saying that I've, so go, go check them out. One's called an airport encounter, a random airport encounter on my LinkedIn. And the other one, you know, the other one is when you get, when, when you've lost all hope, how do you get back up? Those are the two things I want everyone to go read because they, I could never give better advice in my life than I did in those two articles. Uh, yeah, and that's yeah, and, and that's what I was that's what I was referencing, especially in that question. It's it's uh, it's powerful stuff. And I've been there before I started doing what I'm doing now. My wife was eight months pregnant, and and I lost a job, and I'd been there, and I couldn't make my mortgage, and all of that kind of stuff. It's scary times, and you never know how much it it hurts when you in pride in a lot of things when you can't make your bills and that kind of stuff. So I think that's a great read. And I second that people should go out and read there. Let's talk really quickly though, about your, your going to market strategy. Cause it's quite compelling. Uh, tell us about the, the direction you're going there with the lease only program. Yeah. So Nico is very unique because you know, we're a zero emission truck manufacturer, right? Like we build really awesome, cool battery electric and hydrogen electric semi trucks. So what sets us apart from everyone in the world, uh, apart from being the first company in the world that, you know, to actually be first to market, is what sets us apart is the fact that we don't just sell a truck. We have the entire supply chain that comes with it. So in America right now, when you buy a diesel truck, um, you pay 150 grand for that truck. Let's just put a number out there. And then you're going to spend about oh, somewhere around up to about a million, million dollars on fuel over the next, you know, over the life of that thing, over the next million miles of that truck. So what happens is the oil companies are sitting back laughing because every single, you know, their, their greatest salesman for oil companies is, is Peterbilt, Volvo and Daimler. And, you know, they make almost, you know, three quarters of a million to a million dollars on fuel every time you, every time you sell a truck. So they're just back there, just like partying every time you sell a truck. <laughs> and so what we did is I just decided, I said, you know what, that's it. I'm done. I'm taking all the, all the revenue from the oil companies. I'm, I'm going, I'm going all in. And I wanted to make sure that I simplified the process. So when someone buys our truck, all the fuel's covered for the million miles and it's covered at the exact same rate and it never changes. The only thing that can ever change that would be taxes that the government puts on things, but it would it never changes. And right now, to give you an idea, the last three months, oil prices have gone up 40%. So people hedging over the last three months are screwed. You know, so this is the big problem. Like oil goes up and down so volatilely that you can't ever plan for, you know, hedging your, your cost on, on delivery. And with us, we do 20 year power purchase agreements with either wind, solar, or hydroelectricity, you know, farms. And so we have guaranteed rates that never change for 20 years. And that's what sets Nico apart is we're, we make five times more revenue on every truck we sell than our competition. Five times. That's why I believe that five times, you know, more than five times more valuable than all of our companies can put together eventually. And that's what really sets us apart is no, you know, we're an energy technology company where we just build really cool products to consume the energy. 
That is that. That's really cool stuff, and you're absolutely right. That that oil hedging, that well, the oil up and down in the diesel prices has a severe effect on the bottom line for major carriers. There's there's no doubt about that. When it goes up and it goes down, it changes things drastically. And and might I say, a nice pivot from the prostitution ring you started out with in your basement. <laughs> Oh dear! <laughs> <Don't stress. laughs> but 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 seriously, Trevor. Uh, you, you know, you recently said that you know people are just angry across the board, and they really want change. How, in your view, your opinion, how do we be that change? I think you've got to be someone who sets an example and shows people how to actually solve mega complex problems. Um, people are really tired of of these. You know, look, I'm not one to ever, you know, I'm not trying to turn society on each other. I'm, I try to build, um, you know, I try to build relationships with society and, and, and people, right? And I'm going to, I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you a few things that are bothering society and then you can figure out how to actually solve it. One of the problems that people have right now is that they see a lot of these rich CEOs and bankers and they sit back and they make a couple hundred million dollars a year, a billion dollars a year or whatever it is, or, or tens of millions of dollars a year. And the whole economy is going to hell. And they're laying off half their workforce and they're still pulling out a huge amount of money. So what we decided to do is we just said, look, our, you know, the society will rally around you if you solve a problem. That's what Tesla did with the electric vehicle is the kind of the emission problem, right? We solved the oil revenue, getting rid of all the oil revenue to the oil companies and also cleaning up the environment in a grander fashion than anyone has ever done in history. So if Nikola pulls off its business model, and the next seven years will reduce more pollution than I think any company in the history of the world has ever done. And that's a pretty big statement, right? That's huge. Yes, yeah. it is. Um, yes, it is. People for. Well, Trevor, in order to do that, you got to get the trucks on the road. I know you have some huge POs like with InBev. How long before we start seeing the Nikolas rolling down there, pulling 53s, taking pictures and sharing them on social? So that's uh, that's that's a that's a good question. Next year, that's how quick. Next yeah, year, we're, that's awesome. We, that's how close we are. People don't realize this. It takes three years to validate a truck chassis after you have it done. This is why that uh, we we signed a joint venture with Iveco out of Europe. It, it was worth ten, you know tens of billions of dollars to us in our value of our of of our company. And why? Because they had they brought us complete validated chassis and parts and supply chain, and factories, ready to go. We took our technology, and within about four months, we had it on the truck. And their engineers were blown away. They said, we've never moved this fast in our life. And we have trucks now coming off the assembly line right now, being uh, you know being hand-built, being tested on the assembly line, hand-built. And then they, then they start full production next year. So next year, we have our battery electric trucks coming out, full production. And then about a year after that, you have the hydrogen electric trucks coming out, um, as well, so we're we're going to be the first one in the world with uh, with full production zero emission semi trucks, beating everybody. Wow, that, I mean that that's amazing. That that's amazing. What you guys are doing is fantastic, and uh, you know I, I think that your your stock is going to going to go through the roof, especially as people start getting used to seeing these things on the road. It's amazing stuff. We need to have you back on soon. But in the meantime, where do people go after listening to this to learn more? Well, the biggest day of our life yesterday was obviously our Nasdaq listing. Uh, we got listed on. NASDAQ NKLA is the, is the ticker. So if anyone wants to go and look at like what our, what our company stock is, that's what it is. NKLA. So November Kilo Lima Alpha. I'm a pilot, by the way, you can tell. Um, and, uh, and then you go to, and you can go to our website to see all of our product. That's uh, Nikola motor.com. It shows you everything we, and one thing that the consumer, you know, people may not know is we don't just build trucks. We actually got some really cool off-road zero emission equipment, you know, vehicles like off-road UTVs and watercraft. And that's like my way of connecting to the rest of the world that doesn't drive trucks. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun, man. We got a lot of cool stuff coming out. Trevor, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. And again, best of luck to, to you and your team that has grown to over 350 people in a, in a few short years. It's amazing stuff and amazing to hear. Thanks so much. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, Trevor. Wow. I mean, what a story from, from basement. And this is a company that started in 2014 and has grown yeah. – immensely since then they they've had they just had an amazing partnership that the merger that they've put on they're on the boards now it, it i don't know exciting stuff it's it's a growing six. space and uh it's, it's an indication of the future right it really is six years ago he's in his basement 
six years so, ago. <laughs> it's not long ago. The other thing that I thought was really interesting, real quick, Dooner, was that he talked about sourcing of the power. So on his electric trucks, he's getting it from solar and wind energy farms. Hey, hey, Hope is with us now. Hope, I, I apologize hey, Hope. for this. We we're trying to connect with uh, with one guest. We got the answering machine. They dialed back. So I did not mean to to put you on on hold right there. And I'm so glad you're you're back with us now. <laughs> totally fine. I totally understand. It's okay. <laughs> Hope you're you're the best. And what we were what we were leading with this is we were talking a bit about what's what's going on in America. And, and I've been asking all the leaders who've come on, you know, how we can be a positive change. And I think a lot of people in supply chain, what I've been hearing, especially people I talk to on LinkedIn, is just what can we do to to be better. There's a real honest. Uh, approach that people are trying to take to this topic. Uh, everyone's ears and eyes are open to this situation. So shed some light on it, too, from your perspective. Uh, where are we at with things and what can we do to be better? So definitely for the messaging to employees, it definitely needs to be consistent and direct. Um, being black in America is tough, okay? That's just what it is. There's no way to sugarcoat that. So being a black employee or a different ethnicity within a company, um, the company definitely needs to come in ready to listen, understand, and respond. Um, concede that there is racism in America and quite possibly uh, within the company address those issues head on um, without waiver. I think in the past, we have tried to address the issues, but they have not um, necessarily been resolved. And then the company needs to understand that conceding um, in addressing the racism does not mean that, you know, we're losing, but more so we're winning because what you do is you add value to your minority employees. You give those employees a sense of that my company cares, a uh, sense of pride, you know, we have inc we feel included and we have more confidence. Um, but if the company is coming back in, given the current atmosphere, it's not really to address these issues head on, then the problem will die down, we'll put a Band-Aid on it, and then essentially it will come back. Yeah, that, I mean, powerful Re words. Hope. Yeah, very, very solid stuff for the business leader leaders that are out there. And, and you know, Hope, what what, uh, what pains me about the situation is that people are just looking to be equal, no more, no less, right? In, in, in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of the public and in the eyes of the workforce. So individually, how can what, what can we do to make this change? What can we do to help? So lastly, um, individually, we can implement some training and some programs to address racial and interpersonal skills. I think some employees truly miss the mark on the appropriateness of conversations on how to have conversations with a black or a minority employee. Um, introduce maybe some mental health awareness for minorities. Understanding that, as I stated before, it's stressful being black in America, and some of these issues that keep coming up or arising is affecting the mental health of your employees. So definitely implementing those training programs where we address racial interpersonal skills, which means we understand how to have those conversations. Don't come from a place of a sense of entitlement or a sense of no, but truly ed educating yourself on what your minority or your black uh, co-workers or counterparts are enduring on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, home. You know, you know what can really change people's life is is mentorship, right? Especially in communities where great opportunities are not afforded to students, young professionals, employees. How do we be better? How do we be better mentors? Do you think people are doing enough to just reach out to someone? Maybe you see someone on LinkedIn struggling, regardless of even race. You see someone struggling. Is uh, should we be putting our wings out more often? Yeah, not not necessarily that we we aren't doing enough, but when you put those wings out. Be sincere and make sure that those feelings are not just put out just to say that I met my quota. Um, in my experience in dealing with diversity, supply diversity teams, per se, in companies, it's been more to say that, yes, we have those programs in place, and, yes, we play ball with minorities and blacks, but not really truly honestly giving us a fair chance at being able to be a part of economic growth with our counterparts. So I think we need to be honest about the true numbers and when we want to do business with minorities and blacks in supply chain. 
Very, very, very good advice. And, you, you know, I hope uh, Mike Vincent here, that this year we've seen some radical changes in America. We, I mean, we, we've seen some changes, some things and right. ways that radically changed America. And, and so we're, we're talking about return to normal, whether, it, you know, it'd it be the, the economy picking up, et cetera, going back to work, et cetera, but a return to, to normal. But for some Americans, that, that return to normal means going back to a state of, of oppression, Right. And so what what should we be moving towards? What does that look like to you? So moving towards that, that, as I stated before, that desire and it requires an actionable solution that truly provides diverse and minority suppliers an opportunity to thrive, not just for suppliers, but employees. We want equal pay. We want to be heard and understand, understood. Um, We want to be treated with respect and not the joke of the office or the off-tone joke of the office. We want those things. Um, I think we have to stop. Um, I'm country, so let me just go look at it. We have to stop um, shoo-shooing and, and padding it and putting a Band-Aid over the situation. We have to address it head on. Um, black Americans have been oppressed in the United States for many, many, many years. We can handle it. But we would much rather move forward just as the rest of the country would. And the only way we can do that is address it and resolve the issues going forward. Hey, Hope, you have uh, you have some comments here, too. Stephanie Heaton, she says, hey, Hope, I am your biggest fan. Linda Pierre, Lydia Pierre says, uh, mentorship is so impactful. And Marshada Jeffrey yes. says, hey, Hope, my mentor, thank you for dropping gems. And, uh, you know, I, th- and that, that begs the question to me. So Vincent and I, me and the dude, we have this platform here. We have What the Truck. We have other mm-hmm. shows that we do. What can we do to to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem? So create some programs or some ever some marketing tools to help support uh, getting diverse suppliers out on your platform. Um, I think I've already touched base with you, Donor, and you helped me out with that. But extend your hand out to those diverse suppliers to advertise their businesses or some training programs or some processes to help them understand how they can market on a platform such as FreightWave or LinkedIn. Um, I think that's something that definitely you all can implement right now to build those relationships for diverse suppliers or minorities. That, is, that will be very helpful. Um, we're, we, we're all stuck on the whole social media platform, but having a true sense of um, identity on a platform such as Freightway as a transportation supplier like myself, it takes you to the, another level. But if you're not under, you don't have that understanding or that educational background to find Freightway, then you're lost. So I think if Freightway put some programs in place or LinkedIn put some programs in place to pull those minorities in, then it will be um, that much easier. LinkedIn can be very intimidating, particularly for minority suppliers. Um, Let's just keep it 100. Yeah. (laughs) LinkedIn is all about titles and education and, oh, look at me. I'm this person. I'm that person. I have this title and I have it. But truly, doing great business is about relationships and you being able to provide a service to your customer. And that's often found in small minority suppliers and diverse suppliers. But we're not given the same opportunity because we don't have these large titles or sometimes touted as the most educated um, behind our name. We are, but we're not given those same opportunities. Hope, I agree 100%. Uh, Amen. Actually, we are having an internal meeting in Freight Waves about getting to, to, to how to enact some of these things. Um, you or, or other leaders within the supply chain who have ideas, don't be shy about DMing me. We're more than happy to work with you and see how we can implement those. Ingrid Brown says, I'm with Shannon Courier. You are my sister. Such a strong lady in this world. We are blessed. Hope White is a mentor in trucking. And I got to give a little uh, a little cowbell for that one. I mean, that's that's just excellent stuff. <laughs> But Hope White, Hope White, how do people reach out and how do they learn more, especially if they either want that mentorship or they want to work with HD White Logistics? Awesome. So to work with HD White Logistics, www.hdwhitelogistics.com or mentorship, hopewhiteconsulting.com. And then we also have a e-learning course with logisticallyspeaking.online where they can find out more information about working with Hope White and HD White Logistics. 
Thank you so much, Hope. And uh, one more from here is from Lydia Perry. She says, thank you for even having the discussion and using your platform to do so. That's an awesome first step. Yeah, and that's, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, to do the best we can. And like I said, be part of that, that solution. And uh, Hope, thank you for helping us move thank you. towards that goal. Thank you, Hope. Thank, thank you, Hope. so much, Donor. We'll talk soon. Thank we you. Will. Take care. Wow, that was that that was amazing. That was very uh, eye opening, impactful, and and meaningful. Yeah, it, it, it really was. And you know, Duna, I was just I was just thinking, you know, if you want some light reading, pick up uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer's uh, "The Cost of Discipleship." Uh, kidding on the light reading, it's pretty deep stuff. But it brings to mind that one of the things that you need to do is is it, 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 if it's not impacting you, it's not enough to just move on saying, "Well, I'm not a racist and I, and I and I treat everybody equally and I don't see it right in front of me." So let the other people deal with it. You have to get involved with what you believe in, and if you believe that this is the the right cause, then you need to reach out whether it's and, and get involved, whether 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 it's infecting you immediate affecting you immediately or, or not, right? Yeah. Hey, let's reach out to Dave Abels and Wayne Craig. They are doing a, a road trip across America. Dave Abels, he wants to get a better idea of what truckers are facing out there. So he's jumping in the truck with Wayne Craig going across America, and they're even fundraising along the way. Thank you for joining the show. It's Dave Abels, CEO of the Dart Network, and Wayne Craig, he's a trucker. He's moving, he's moving America, and he's got the news to move you now. Thanks, gentlemen. How are you doing? <laughs> How are you guys doing? Thanks for, uh, <laughs> thanks for joining us. I'm so excited about this fifth wheel trip that you guys are doing across America. And uh, the dude and I are so happy that you decided to include us in this. This is sort of the precursor today. This is the appetizer menu or the wine list. And then next Friday, you guys are going to have footage from your trip. You're going to recount what you saw and what you learned. But tell us a little bit about why you got back in the truck after 25 years, Dave. Oh, I'll tell you what, you know, I spent a lot of time in my role as a president and CEO out visiting with customers. Right now, we all know it, COVID-19, you can't see any customers. So my next best customer, probably even better most times, is our drivers and independent contractors. So I felt like I'm asking them to go out. I'm asking them to talk, go out and visit customers every day, stop in truck stops, stop in rest areas. So I may as well do it along with them, right? So I'm going to be out there with Trucker Wayne. Today we've set up um, our trips. We've got our schedule lined up where we're going to stop. We did our trip plans, and we're going to be meeting with drivers at locations all across the country. So I think it's just going to be great to engage with the, with the drivers and contractors. Uh, ultimately, that's my goal, Tim, is just to get back to the basics and show them that I'm in this with them. I mean, at, from the top down at the Dart Network, we're, we're truckers, right? And that's what we're going to be doing is going trucking. Yeah, you are. Hey, uh, Wayne Craig posted, uh, working with the GoFundMe charity team has been incredible. We will be posting the new charity campaign for St. Christopher's Relief Fund. Big topic on this show on Friday during a live interview with Freightways uh, Dooner and the Dude during What the Truck. Tell us what that's all about. Yeah, this is uh, Wayne here. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. I tried something individually a while back. And it didn't quite work out. So when uh, Dave and I were trying to put this thing together, um, we were trying to talk about what charity would be you know, best to work with. And I mentioned uh, St. Christopher Trucker Relief Fund, which DART has worked with, uh, the DART Network has worked with before. And uh, wow, we it's going to be put out officially. I worked with the GoFundMe charity setting all this up uh, in San Diego there. So after our show here, we're going to start putting it out there and blasting it out there. And uh, I couldn't, we're all, we already have raised some money. Also, if you uh, didn't know, another great thing is next week, I'm going to be on the uh, Trucker Life podcast and they were going to have a big announcement uh, for that very thing for the St. Christopher Trucker Relief Fund. So um, I couldn't be happier that Mr. Abels is getting inside my truck to see what we've you know, what we're dealing with every day, but more, more, I'm more excited about raising some money for the St. Christopher Trucker Relief Fund. It's going to be huge. And I know you all have been trying to raise money as well. Yeah, that, that, that's really good stuff. So it really two good causes, learning what is out there and how we can better help these drivers and learning what they're going through this and raising money for St. Christopher's Fund. I, I really hope you guys are incredibly successful. Dooner and I, we're, we're, we're trying to get them above that $1 million. Let's make it $2 million. Let's get it as high as we possibly can in that fund, right, Dooner? Let's let's blow it up. You, hey. you, you posted yesterday that uh, truck broke down and you had to hoof it to Egan, Minnesota. Is that true? <laughs> No, and after, was, uh, listen, after after what you posted uh, uh, that you were eating at some of these restaurants, I probably would have been walking it myself. It, it looked like it might get a little scary in that cab. Tell you what, 
He scared my director of maintenance so bad. The guy called me up on the phone. I think he's broke down. It's on TV right now. I said, no, 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 no. But, hey, real quick, guys, we're going to be stopping tomorrow night, Trucker Wayne and I, at the TA in Forestall, Missouri. Anybody's welcome to stop. We're buying dinner. The Truck Stops of America have been very gracious to us. They're going to set us up. So whether you're with the Dart Network or you're with anyone else and you want to talk about trucking, you want to let me know what's happening out there on the road, I'm going to be more than willing to listen. Hook up with us tomorrow night. And then the following night, we'll be at the Flying Day in Reseca, Georgia. Um, and we're wearing a black 2020 Kenworth with the Dart Network on it. And uh, we really want people to stop in, join us. We're doing this for a good cause, not only for for me as an executive of a trucking company to learn about what's going on on the road, but we've got the charitable comp- contribution component of it as well. So we're, we're stoked. And I, I'm starting out tomorrow morning. Wayne and I will be pre-tri- pre-tripping the truck. I'm going to do it. Now, I guys, I, I drove. been a long time. So he's going to have to refresh my memory on some of it. But we're going to start out tomorrow morning with the true pre-trip. And we're going to go hook a load at uh, Post Foods in uh, Northfield, Minnesota. And then we're headed out and going trucking. And I've already failed him on the pre-trip, so I have to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, real quick, real quick question. Sorry, Dooner. When are you going to be in Resaca? Uh, we're going to be there between 5 and 6 p.m. on Sunday night. We're going to do dinner there, and they're dialing us in at the Flying J as well. I got giveaways for all kinds of drivers from the Truck Stops of America, Flying J Pilot, and we're just going to have some good conversation. This is your opportunity, drivers and independent contractors, to let one of the nation's largest trucking company CEO know what it's like out there on the road. Dude, Dave, that, that's amazing. And this is this is a week where especially a lot of leaders are being looked towards to show empathy. And in this situation, you know, you are you are gaining that empathy by sitting with drivers and seeing what they go through in 2020 in America. I think it's an important me- a message from leadership, not to just, you know, post a message on, on social media or something, but also to be out there and, and understanding what people are going through, regardless of what they do or who they are. I agree, Tim. And like I said, you know, we're going to hit rest areas. So we're going to go to rest areas. If they're not open, we've talked a lot about that. COVID-19 shut down rest areas. You're going to Port-A-John. You're going to see Dave Abel, the CEO of the Dart Network, at a Port-A-John tomorrow, <laughs> or whatever we're coming up against. And that's the reality of it. I want to live life just like the driver. That's, that's why I'm most excited about him uh, coming on board, too, because so much has uh, changed since uh, the COVID-19 and, and all of us truck drivers that have seen the change, a lot of places, a lot of rest areas now are opened up, even if they, they're just giving us that parking spot, as uh, Mr. Abel's uh, mentioned, and using the porta potties. And the biggest thing, too, is we're going to be in a shipper and receiver at some point, too. And a lot of them have closed off their rest areas at well, or they've yeah, closed their rest areas off. And um, what do we do if we get there and we have, these are things that nobody wants to talk about, but Mr. Abel is going to see firsthand that I go into a shipper receiver, I can't use their restroom. What do we do? Those are things that we don't like to talk about, but actually happening right now. And and the beauty is that I'm going to be able to get back with that shipper and receiver and talk to them about the inconvenience it puts on drivers across the country. Yeah. Hey guys, you know what? I think that my road dog audience needs to hear this too. So if you have time between three and five tomorrow, I'll message Wayne and see about having you guys call in on the air just to get an update where you are. Even if it's just for a couple of minutes, I think that audience would love to hear it. And you're also doing a a good cause out there. So we appreciate it. I can't wait to also touch base with you next Friday when you've gotten further on the trip and you've gotten gotten some video and all that stuff. Thank you guys so much and drive safe out there. All right. Take care, Tim. Thank you. Right on. God bless. Safe travels. What a journey. What a journey those gentlemen are going on. Yeah, right on, man. <laughs> and for a good cause. That's 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 a road trip. Ingrid Brown says she can't wait to see this trip. Speaking of people who will be calling in on radio tomorrow, let's uh, let's do some real quick bad news, good news. Okay. for you. Everyone's dying for some sports. So according to Bleacher Report, the NBA is coming back. 22 teams will take part in the 2019-2020 season's conclusion. That includes the 16 franchises in playoff position at the time of the NBA suspension March 11th and the six teams within six games of a playoff berth. Uh, They also, Adam, ESPN's Adrian Wojnowski, 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 I should know that. I'm part Polish. I think it's, I think it's Smith. (laughs) <laughs> first reported the league's board of governors approved a restart plan Thursday and involves holding the remaining games at the ESPN worldwide complex in Orlando, Florida. Uh, if you're not in playoff position, the bad news is if you're not in playoff position, you're already eliminated. 
<laughs> Is that right? Okay, well, there you, <laughs> there you go. So bad news, Dooner. You spent yeah. 1999 renting Trolls World oh. Tour, and now your kids are bugging you to see it again. What do you do, my friend? <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in this position, right? So here's the good news, though, brother. A release date has been announced for purchase July 7th. A little more Ooh. good news. CNN reports Hollywood is inching closer to getting back to work with the entertainment industry's guild and unions signing off on a 22-page guideline document designed to establish safety protocols for producing movies and TV in the age of coronavirus. So so, there you go, man. Back, more people back to work, dude. And uh, both Amen. of our kids will be happy about Trolls World Tour. Here's one good one. I'm happy to end on it. Bad news. Protests have raged through the streets of America as Americans cry out for actions against racial injustice. We all heard about that. But yeah. here's something that yeah. good that happened during it. As much bad as we've seen, there's also been some great stuff, some great shiny examples of humanity from that rendition of Lean on Me in Washington, D.C. that you may have seen on LinkedIn. I showed to Caesar, the no drama llama who joined peaceful protests in Portland, where he allowed people to hug him and helped ease the tension. There's been a lot of heartbreaking images and videos and all this, but there's also been some amazing examples of who we are as Americans and who we can be as people and what we can move towards. You can follow me at Timothy Dooner on Twitter. You can find him at Michael Vincent on the LinkedIn, at Vincent the Dude on the Twitter. Subscribe to this What the Truck on your favorite podcast player of choice or Freightcast. Get every single Freightways podcast. Radio will be on tomorrow, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time Series. XM's Road Dog Trucking. Have some excellent guests on there. Hug your own llama. Don't bring the drama. What do you got to say to me and my mama, Mr. Dude? <laughs> hey, be excellent to each other out there. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's all we can strive to do. <laughs> right on. I, I am. And by the way, thank you to all of the leaders who came on our show today yes. and were willing to talk on such a sensitive and hard subject, you know, not shying away from it. A lot of them putting messaging out there, letting them know they support their employees and they're doing it not just with messaging, but with hiring and all of those necessary things. And we, too, are going to work to be part of that change. And uh, any suggestions you have, reach out to us, as we mentioned to you. Uh, let's get us out of here, man. This has been a great show. It's been a great week. We'll be back on Monday, 12 p.m. Eastern Time live. Right Peace here. and love. Take it easy, guys. A little cowbell for everybody out there. A little cowbell for that llama. A little cowbell for Hope White. Trevor Milton for that big raise on. That big raise going on, going on the board with NKLA. Andrew Silver. And that road trip. Drive safe, everybody. As Michael Vincent says, peace and love. Peace and love.